anybody here remember something really great that happened on October 28th, 2016? I didn't really think so, that's the point. I'm going to tell you, the International Maritime Organization, IMO, the global association that regulates shipping, announced that as of 2020, there would be a 0.5% limit on the sulfur content of ship fuel globally. Now, you might be thinking, that doesn't really sound like such a big deal. But you're wrong. Millions of people will live longer lives because of that decision. Maybe even you or someone you know. It turns out that ship fuel is really dirty, so the current limit is 3.5%, and it causes a lot of the air pollution around the world that kills people. Now, you may still be thinking, well, this doesn't sound that interesting, but I have good news for you. The news media actually agrees with you. They don't seem to report this stuff, and I can only presume that's because people think it's kind of boring. But I actually think these good news stories are really important. I think it's a problem that we don't know about them, and I'm going to try to change your mind. Here's another one. You probably know that Chinese cities have a lot of air pollution. What you probably don't know is that in 2014, the Chinese government declared war on air pollution. And since then, the concentration of fine particulates in the air in Chinese cities has dropped 32%. That's almost one-third in four years, with huge health benefits. If the air quality in Chinese cities keeps going like that, then we'll basically just look at China as having done something very similar to what Western countries did just a little bit earlier. Burned a lot of coal, industrialized, and then sorted out their air quality afterwards. And if you don't believe me, then believe an impressionist painter. This is Claude Monet painting London at the start of the last century. And I'm not going to argue with you that London's air quality is quite where it should be, but I can assure you it used to be a lot worse. Okay, um, there are actually a lot of environmental success stories, and I'm going to tell you a bunch in this talk. But you may be thinking to yourself, this guy's a bit crazy. I mean, the Earth is in deep, deep trouble. We're killing off uh, biodiversity at an alarming rate. Uh, we're chucking plastic in the oceans. Climate change may eventually turn us into water world. He's just cherry picking good news stories. And that's kind of my point. I don't need to tell you that the world is in deep, deep trouble. I'm going to take for granted that you know it is. There are a lot of environmental problems. They're serious and we need to do something about them. But what I'm going to focus on are the solutions. Because it turns out, when we try to solve environmental problems, it's surprisingly easy. We just don't try very hard. One reason is I don't think people actually really understand, in many cases, what environmental problems are. So I'm going to tell you. I'm going to start with an analogy. Let's suppose you have a garden. Maybe you have a garden just outside your house. Do you pollute your garden? Do you throw litter into your garden? No, of course you don't. Why not? Because you would be the one to pay the price. But you actually litter other people's gardens all the time. You think you don't, but you do. You litter the garden that is the sky every time you take a flight that emits greenhouse gases. You litter the garden 
that is silence every time you drive your car at night and somebody has to listen to it. You litter the garden that is the earth every time you buy food that was grown using chemical pesticides. What's the difference between the littering that we don't do and the littering that you do and I do and we all do all the time? The difference is that in the first case, you don't pay the price. In the second case, you do. And that's actually the reason behind every environmental problem in the world. Why do we pollute? We pollute because it's cheap to ourselves, but not to everybody else. So the problem with pollution is that it's more bad than good for society as a whole, especially if we include future generations in our definition of society. But it's more good than bad to the individual polluter. So the heart of an environmental problem is a failure of social coordination. There's a kind of misalignment of incentives. And the problem fundamentally is that the polluter doesn't pay the full cost. So what then is the best solution to environmental problems? You may already see where I'm going with this. We need to make the polluter pay to pollute. It's that simple. If we do that, then someone who wants to pollute can continue to do so, but they'll only do so as long as the costs to all of society don't outweigh the benefits. Okay? So this really works, um, I know, because, like I say, there's a really good track record for this. Environmental um, taxes, and yes, we're talking about taxes, turns out work exceptionally well. So I'm originally from Western Canada, uh, the province of British Columbia, and just by coincidence, British Columbia actually um, has one of the world's very best carbon taxes. It was introduced in 2008. It's been ramped up over the years, so it's now $35 per ton. That's about 240 kroner. A decade has gone by, and so researchers have had time to study the impact of the program. And what they've found is that compared to a scenario where British Columbia did not have the carbon tax, emissions have gone down about 10%. And they've also assessed the economic cost, which the best studies show was about zero. That's right. It had negligible, basically trivial effects on standards of living. And that is a general pattern. Lots of people think that solving environmental problems is really expensive. It's going to cost a lot of money. Um, economically unaffordable. You can protect nature or you can have a thriving economy, but you can't have both. Um, some hardcore environmentalists would say we need degrowth, maybe a revolution against capitalism, uh, at the very least some kind of lower standard of living. There's a really weird parallel with some political conservatives who argue that we need deregulation, a revolution against environmentalism, a lower standard of environment. I actually think they're both wrong. We can have environmentalism and we can have high standards of living, economic growth and good environmental protection. We just need to put in place the right policies to encourage people not to pollute and to find better cleaner ways of producing and making the stuff that we want. Okay, let's just take an example, a case of Sweden, the whole country, the economy. From 1990 to 2013, the Swedish economy grew 61%. Greenhouse gas emissions dropped 23%. Higher standards of living, 
lower environmental impact. Think about clean energy. Compared to 10 years ago, wind turbines can produce the same electricity at half the wind speed. So efficiency has doubled in a decade. Solar power is actually even more impressive. Um, solar panels are great, right? I mean, the fuel is about as convenient as you could hope for, sunlight. Um, the only problem with solar panels is you have to pay something up front to manufacture them and then put them on the roof of your house or whatever. So the real question is just how much electricity do you get out of a given quantity of solar panel? And what's amazing is how fast the price has been coming down. The price for one watt of solar energy has dropped 73% since 2010. 73%. I'm not talking about a generation or half a generation. It's just a few years. It's been that fast. And this, too, is a general pattern. When we really try, when the incentives are right, we actually develop new technologies at an astonishing rate. Um, can I just ask, are there engineers in the room? Hands up. Any engineers? I salute you. You can do amazing things. If you ask my wife, she'll tell you, I can barely put up a shelf. But much as you enjoy developing new technologies and finding new ways to do things, and I know you do, I think the best motivation is a you know, mix of altruism and self-interest. And like everybody else, you like to take home a paycheck at the end of the month. So what's really important is that the financial incentives be there for your companies to develop the new technologies. And only government can put those incentives in place, which is why there's such an important role for governments raising the price of pollution to the polluter. OK. That brings me back to the, the issue of the price on pollution. Let me give you a great example of this. Um, back in the 1980s, when I was growing up in Western Canada, the eastern part of the US was producing a lot of its electricity uh, from coal plants. And the problem with coal is if you burn it, it tends to contain sulfur, and so that makes sulfur dioxide, which goes up in the atmosphere and eventually comes down as acid rain, which does a lot of harm to trees and ecosystems and even buildings. So Canadian government starts saying to the American government, yeah, we're not so keen on all this pollution you're kind of dumping across the border onto us. And after a few years, the American government sort of says, OK, yeah, maybe you've got a point. You're nice folks. We won't do that anymore. So they tried to find a really efficient way of you know, solving this problem at the lowest economic cost. And they introduced a really innovative program called an emissions trading system. So the idea is that a coal-burning power station would have to um, have a permit for every ton of sulfur that it emitted. And the total quantity of permits that would be allocated would sort of taper down as the years go by. So the, the amount of pollution would definitely gradually reduce. Well, what happened? Over the course of the next 20 years, sulfur emissions dropped dramatically. We basically don't have much of a problem with acid rain anymore in the eastern part of North America. It also cost a lot less than people had even anticipated. And the most amazing thing of all, it turns out, I mentioned this earlier about the ships thing, sulfur in the air is pretty bad for human health. So not only was it a great environmental policy, it actually ended up being a great public health policy. The system imposed a clear incentive for polluting power stations to find different ways of doing business, and they did. Governments do an amazing job of dealing with pollution when they put a price on different kinds of pollution. There's other examples like the London congestion charge, the Gothenburg congestion charge, that little price you pay every time you want, you know, a plastic bag at the supermarket. These things work great. I hope you'll already understand why I don't actually think that these kinds of things are 
financially problematic. Think about climate change. Um, the reason why climate scientists are so freaked out about it is because it could be bad, like really bad, change life on Earth bad. So you tell me, would it save money to make a complete mess of the planet and then have to fix it later? Or would it be cheaper just to prevent the problem in the first place? It's obvious, right? Okay, now, if we solved all these environmental problems, why haven't we solved so many more? I'm a social scientist, and um, I study public opinion. And I'm going to show you something of what I've learned about this question. Consider this. Generally speaking, how concerned are you about environmental issues? Not at all concerned, very concerned, or something in the middle. This question was put to thousands of people around the world in big cross-national surveys, and here's the distribution of answers to that question. Basically, humanity accepts that environmental problems are real, they're serious, and there's something to worry about. But consider another question. How willing would you be to pay much higher taxes in order to protect the environment? This is the distribution of answers to that question. Most people around the world are opposed to the policy measure which would be most cost-effective and has an excellent track record for dealing with environmental problems. I think this is actually a really significant barrier to better environmental protection today. Um, now, you might be saying, yeah, of course, nobody likes paying taxes, um, but the reality is when governments introduce environmental taxes, they pretty much always do this. They replace them with other, they, they raise environmental taxes and lower other, envi other taxes at the same time. Um, when British Columbia introduced its environmental tax, or it lowered income tax, so basically people didn't pay more. So what if we could explain that to people? Well, I've tested the impact of telling people this. I used a survey experiment, which basically means we give a sample of people different versions of a question and we see what difference it makes. So here's one version. How willing would you be to pay higher taxes to protect the environment? Much like what you saw before. But some people saw a slightly different version. How willing would you be to pay higher taxes to protect the environment if the government introduced or reduced other taxes you pay by the same amount? And the bump you get in public support is tremendous, more than I ever would have thought but there's a problem. I also tried this question. How willing would you be to pay higher taxes to protect the environment if the government promised to reduce other taxes you pay? And we lose a huge chunk of that bump. There's a lot of people who just don't trust governments to do it right and honestly. Now, sometimes governments don't deserve our trust, of course, but I think we tend to trust governments too little, actually, rather than too much. Let me just sum up by saying I've given you some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that the world is in trouble. The planet needs changes fast. The good news is we have the tools to do it and they wouldn't even cost that much money. Um, environmental policies work great. We just don't use them enough. So it's like we've got a problem with our health. We've gone to the doctor and the doctor said, you need 50 milligrams a day of this medicine. And we've gone home and we've taken five milligrams per day for a while. And then we sort of wonder, well, why aren't I feeling better? I say, let's take the medicine. Thank you. <laughs>